Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 581. That is Cinco Ocho Uno of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga once again. I hope you're doing well wherever this show may find you. How am I? You know, good as usual, shining bright, living healthy, eat eating well drinking loads of good water or over the weekend i didn't eat too well i had a little cheeky mcdonald's on the weekend but for the most part and the popeyes actually yeah exactly <laughs> had the popeyes i think on a friday and then a little bit of mcdonald's on the friday but um apart from that apart from that i've been fairly fairly on the on the button with stuff especially during the week at home and that's the most important thing really i think the monday to friday which ends up being my like you know 80 percent of my week in terms of what i'm intaking and usually when you're at home and you're bored and you've got nothing to do the first thing i end up doing is you know going to the shop local health license and grabbing some processed food but apart from that i've also been getting burnt I'm not too sure if I've spoken about this previously, but I've discovered in the last few months that although I might be black, I'm not exactly African in that I can't just stand in the sun with no protection on my skin and not get punished. And the last few days I went for a bike ride and whatever, and my whole legs got burnt up and then it led to some really gnarly heat rashes, which then evolved into a bit of eczema because I've suffered from that in the past. And then my hands ended up getting a little bit of it too, where it ended up getting all raggedy and raw. So I had to spend like 20 22 pound or 26 pound on some aloe vera and some e45 cream and boots on the over the weekend like just to try and repair my skin to some level of acceptability but god damn it man my legs were looking lit as well these last couple of weeks isn't it because i've been oiling them well i've been moisturizing i've been doing loads of like you know um, back squats and whatnot and deadlifts and running a bunch and now they're just covered in this flaky snake-like skin all over them because i decided that i didn't need to put any sunscreen on so or sunscreen on so now i've been punished i've learned my lesson that's per usual you know with boys when you learn your lesson the, the, the first thing that you do when you learn a lesson like that very very harshly is that you make sure you don't repeat it again and you make sure you get the thing that you need in order to not have that happen again but that's been a really interesting realization of mine over the last few it's been very very interesting to say the least i'm not going to lie and then what else i've been doing that's about it really i'm preparing for my berlin trip of course that's going to be fun so I'm looking forward to going to eat drink and be merry so that should be great and what else that's it really nothing else oh yeah and planning long term for some festivals coming up in what is it july so another one coming up in august so it's going to be back-to-back -back festivals in that regard oh yeah actually they are in it i've just remembered they are going to be back-to-back -back. when is it again let's see dicks in that manner that's the first thing i'm meant to be going to is that in july when is that oh 9th of july god damn it and then the other thing i'm going to is houghton right <laughs> I'm just double check this and make sure I think it's legit. Yeah, how and festival. Okay, cool. So I've got those back to back happening. So I've got to make sure I get all my P's and Q's and get all my, you know, my little uh, monies and that saved up and scrunched up and want to go. Um, Dixon at Tough Manor won't be too bad because from what I remember, it's, it's a London thing anyway that I'm going to. Um, so that won't be too much of a bother to go to that. And then the other thing I'm meant to be going to is um, Houghton Festival which is going to require some spending in terms of, you know, having a ticket, getting the tent all set up and stuff, but that shouldn't be too much of a bother either. But I'm looking forward to going there because people have always had really good things to say about that festival coming up. So that's something I'm definitely looking forward to going to very, very soon. Um, let me see here, Toss Manor. When is that? It's 9th of July, right? It is 9th of July, if I'm not mistaken. Where is it? Da, 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 da. Yeah, it's 9th. Okay, Lost in the Moment. Yeah, 9th of July. Lost in the Moment. Here it is there. This is what I'm going to, actually. One of the first festivals I'm going to. So um, this should be fun. I'm really looking forward to going to this. Um, absolutely insane lineup of people that I would always love to see play. Um, v. Dixon, Avalon Emerson, of course. I've wanted to see for a long time to get to see her. It's going to be great. 
uh, Chloe Chalet, I don't know, Too Tough, DJ Holographic, I know from Detroit, Elk, I don't know, Good Jansen, of course, I've seen plenty of times, High, I've not seen play out, actually, even though I want to really see her play, and she's got an album at the moment that people are going crazy over, so that should be great, Jenny Carr, I don't know who that is, um, Jimmy Jules V Tricks, of course, that's going to be great, back-to-back set, that's going to be absolutely stupendous, Man of the Tough is going to be great to see him again, and of course, Nick Castle's one of the people involved with Lambrith in terms of organising it, but yeah, should be a good one, Lost in the Moment happening very soon so can't eager and eager and can't wait to check that out when that ends up happening but that's about it really i think in terms of that sort of stuff um what else is i going to speak about oh yeah that's what i was going to think about isn't it let's move on oh yeah let's i've got many things to talk about actually topic wise too many too many things to mention actually hopefully i can get through the large chunk of it because i've been slacking on the podcast front um in terms of getting these out at a timely man i like to do them monday wednesday friday but sometimes it ends up being tuesday thursday saturday and whatever and i don't like to kind of mess it up too tough but hopefully um you guys can get a kind of glimpse of what i'm trying to do with this stuff and it all makes some sort of semblance of sense and if it doesn't then you know this will just turn into being one of those podcasts that people have where they just talk out of their ass. <laughs> there's plenty of those ones out there, isn't it? Out there at the moment. There's plenty, plenty of those out there at the moment. So um, let's just dive on deep. Okay, one thing I wanted to speak about, I'm going to get this up on here um, as well because I wanted to speak about this too. So I'm going to move this across and make sure it's where I need it to be to speak about it later. But yeah first things first to talk about and i'm going to dive right on into this unfortunately it's regarding football and this has to do with manchester united and this crazy development that happened over the weekend or happened on monday actually regarding ralph ragnick not taking up the consultancy role he's meant to have with man united so um this is a weird one because if you're a united fan the whole reason why we were sold this dream of having ralph ragnick as an interim coach leading into a consultancy coach even though he hadn't been a manager for many years and there were far better managers who were available at the time such as Conte who could have done a better short-term job and maybe would have been something that you could also hire long-term if you wanted or medium to long-term and in my opinion he probably suits what United is currently like as a club more than the likes of going for like a Eric Ten Hag who's going to need real support real like football people in football place in football people in the most important places decision making places sorry in united to get the job done so in my head a conte would have made more sense now get some people don't like his style of play they don't like him as a person but with the way may united are it didn't really make any sense for us to go from Ralph Ragnick. but the obviously the the kind of hope that we all had was that maybe the appointment of Ralph Ragnick would get the club would kind of drag the club kicking and screaming into modernity into just having it set up like a every other successful big club out there in the world who has a clear vision who has directors of football who know what they're doing who has great scouts who gets deals done early who knows how to identify players um all this who, who kind of prioritizes playing attractive football over just you know finishing fourth and all this sort of stuff right that's what you'd kind of hope for and that's what Ralph Ragnick kind of represented because he was like kind of the godfather of the Gegen Press, somebody that, you know, Klopp, Pep, no Klopp, no, Pep, probably let's say Klopp and Tuchel spoke very highly of in terms of coaches and oh, loads of others, um, such as the Southampton manager. And that was what we were kind of getting sold as, as the dream. But then over the last few months, I like guess if you've been paying attention, Ralph has been coming out and saying some very you would deem them to be controversial things in the eyes of Man United, but very refreshing things in for fans like myself. He's been really highlighting the lack of organisation of the club, the lack of clarity, um, confusion around who does what in what job. You know, he questioned, you know, he was asked questions about Darren Fletcher and what he does. He didn't really know what was going on there. There was no real identity. Like, you know, he basically called out the players and said about 10 of them need to be replaced. Loads of really cutting and damning things concerning with the club. And I guess if you take into account what Ralph Ragnar has been saying, the reception that he's been getting from some of the top players who haven't liked him, quote unquote, airing out dirty laundry, what Ralph Rear Ferdinand ended up coming saying recently about he needs to kind of keep quiet, it now kind of leads me to believe that the club never were really intending to kind of follow through with this consultancy role the minute they got someone like an Eric Ten Hag in place anyway because essentially Eric Ten Hag seems like a kind of person after listening to his first press conference who's kind of want to try to who wants to be the master of his own ship he's going to 
set out his plan what he wants to do he's obviously got some experience of working with a great team in terms of ix what he did previously but he seems like somebody who wants to be very hands-on so if that's the case they probably don't need to have a consultancy work a consultant working alongside him because he wants to be hands-on anyway so if you can work if you can have him work alongside john murto darren fletcher and whoever the assistant's meant to be that's maybe, that's maybe where it makes sense but overall the fact that this has happened i think should really be a cause for alarm bells for all united fans out there because what this goes to prove is that most likely than not whoever's in charge in terms of making the football decisions at the club whether it's richard arnold whether it's somebody else in the background whether it's a glazer the whole point of this is that what we've seen so far is that united is very as a club at the moment especially under the glazer ownership we are incredibly resistant to change we are incredibly allergic to criticism. We don't like it in any way, shape or form. The the boardroom people, the owners don't like it. They don't like to be made to look like fools. They don't like to be made to look like they know what they don't know what they're doing, even though they don't know what they're doing. And if you do call them out too often, most likely you're going to lose your job. Now you could also say Ralph Ragnick might have lost his job because he didn't get top four football. Right? Because the whole remit of United managers so far we've seen, interim or not, if you don't get top four football, it usually costs you your job. But the fact that he was always meant to be an interim leading into a consultancy makes me doubt that but then another part of me thinks i remember listening to a duncan castle podcast and he said long time ago when ralph ragnick was given this role he was given the role under the guidance that he could impress the owners enough to get given the job full time so he always came into this role thinking hey i want to make a real big change um and then obviously hopefully take this job on full time and become the manager of united going forward which is obviously a bit of a long shot considering you know his lack of management experience and the clubs he's managed that but it was definitely on the table so the fact that this has happened i think is a clear indication that he's being punished for what he said in public in my opinion i think that's what basically happened he's said too much damning stuff about united right uh, eric ten Hag came in and obviously has his own ideas because he hasn't necessarily had these players under his control under his stewardship for a long time like every other manager he naively thinks that he can whip them into shape he also thinks that he's going to be able to get out loads of players and signing all his own players which never usually ends up happening with united they always end up promising managers things and always reneging on them later on down the line so most likely than not what we're seeing now is already the kind of beginning stages of of a repeat repeated cycles of what we saw in previous managers we might get a couple of good seasons out Eric Ten Hag we might play a some attractive football for a half a season or so whatever it may be but it's quite easy for me to predict right now just from from, from like past experience that we're not going to see any change at United with Eric Ten Hag in place none none whatsoever and I will say this again like I've said this plenty of times United will never win the Premier League again will never win a Champions League again with the Glazers in charge. We're just never going to do it. It's never, ever going to happen. With the Glazers in charge, we are never going to win a major honour ever, ever again. And that's a sad thing about this whole situation. But, you know, the, the owners don't seem to care. The United fans seem to be, um, seem to be just um, resigned to the fact that we are where we are. And I guess the situation that we're into. Anyway. Article courtesy of Sky Sports. It says as follows: Ralph Ragnick will not take up consultancy role at Man United. Um, Ralph Ragnick will not stay in his consultancy role at Man United next season. The German who took the interim role at United says he has made the decision due to his demands of his role as manager of Austria, which is obviously bullshit in my opinion. Um, Ragnick guided United to their worst season in Premier League era as they finished the campaign in six with 58 points and zero goal difference. The funny thing about this is that they never ever mentioned the manager he took he overtook from in terms of Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. I know Ole Gunnar Solskjaer only had us a couple of points off a fourth, but we were playing pretty terribly under Ole Solskjaer. Then he got sacked and everyone kept saying that he has left a really good squad for the next manager to take over from. But it's not a really good squad. We all knew it wasn't a really good squad. We all knew there was problems in there. And then, you know, basically Ralph Ragnick maybe exasper exasperated those problems due to his lack of manager experience. But overall these problems have been there for a long time way before he came so the fact that they try and pin it all on him is very interesting but we continue um Ragnar, da, 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 da. 
The club statement said, We would like to thank Ralph Hamilton for his efforts as interim manager of the past six months. By mutual agreement, Ralph will now focus solely on his new role of manager of Austria and will not therefore take his consultancy role or Trafford. Um, we would like to wish Ralph the best of luck in his next chapter of his career. United manager Eric Ten Hag faced questions about Ragnick in his first press conference on Monday, but was coy when asked if he would be taken on the, the board, if you're taken on board these previous views. He said, I think it's part of my analysis. I observe and speak with a lot of people, but finally I will draw my own line. Press on if he endorses Ragnick's consultancy role. He added that is on the club. So clearly, this decision had really been made when he was having that press conference because it kind of explained why Eric Ten Hag was being very coy, very, very, you know, hesitant to say anything positive about Ralph because I guess by then the decision had already been made. It continues here. Um, what will Ralph Ragnar's man style be? Um, well, a lot of excitement surrounding it. Okay, cool, whatever. So that's basically what I think. So it's, it's a sad state of affairs at United, but again, the circus continues. No real change is going to be made in any way, shape, or form. And we're just going to be here again in another few years when things go belly up again for Everton Hall. People start calling out for our next manager to take over the job. And at this point, I'm just done caring. As long as we get some decent football to watch week in, week out, I'm happy to see that. If we get some young players coming through, if we sign some attack, uh, you know, some young, exciting in talent fair enough but in terms of us actually winning major honours and actually building upon the legacy that was already built and actually going forward and trying to challenge these top teams don't hold your breath mate don't hold your breath um, next on the list here let's skip that one actually let's, next on the list we have news courtesy of yo why have I got this up here I don't know um, let me move this around. I've got some of the stuff I've got here doesn't make any sense. I got it all listed up in the wrong way. Okay, cool. Now let's move on to this. Let's go on to here. Oh, yeah, this is a weird one. So this is courtesy of a Instagram account called Zoe Zanius. Now I've told you plenty of times that I am a you know an unapologetic Bergheim lover so much so that I'm going to be going there very very soon again and it's a place that you know I kind of hold it holds a special place in my heart in terms of um, techno nightclubs around the world it was definitely a place that lived up to the expectations that I had in terms of my head in terms of what I read online in terms of what I saw in terms of documentaries in terms of movies in terms of whatever else it may be concerning that club and definitely a place where it definitely is a place a lot of people can say sets the standards in terms of um you know how clubs should be designed sound systems the booking process um the lineups the way they handle the cues the door picking everything about it is really kind of on point and one of the things i think that's really kind of overlooked or doesn't get spoken about enough is the fact that by and large you know i've been there i'd say 10 plus times right by and large i'd say i can't remember one occasion where I've been in there and I felt number one unsafe or I felt as if there was a fight kicking off or there was some sort of weird disturbance or people were going too crazy it's never felt like that and I think if you've lived in you know doesn't matter if you live in a major city or a smaller city you would know that your you know your kind of local nightclub or your local watering hole it can get rowdy after a period you know after a number of hours that people are spent in there especially if they're doing drugs especially if it's going to be like a dance music electronic music sort of vibe type of thing those kind of things kind of go hand in hand and it's quite refreshing to go to places in Berlin, obviously Bergheim being one of them, and it feels as if like you can be safe, let your hair down without the threat of like stepping on someone's toe and then you're going to suddenly fight somebody. It doesn't happen if ever over there. So for the most part, you always get the impression that if you were, let's say, somebody who didn't necessarily feel comfortable going out at clubs, going to a mega club at Bergheim would be probably one of the safest places that you could go to as weird as it sounds right it's really big you could get up to any sort of madness in any sort of corner but it really does feel like you could end up being super safe in such a club because they take people's safety really seriously but according to this instagram account from a lady called zoe zanias it seems as if that's not the case and lately there's been some really concerning things regarding um her you know basically Burkhan and what's going on over there and by all accounts this lady is an artist in her own right and she read the following this is a uh, from the instagram account of this lady called zoe zanias and this is the following here. Caption says, sharing my story here. If something similar happened to you, feel free to get in touch. Apparently, this is not an isolated incident. So it says as follows. 
On Sunday night, I had a crush, sorry, I had a brush with death in a needle spiking incident at Bergheim. Pretty concerning, right? Someone got spiked in Bergheim. On the dance floor, I was very suddenly experienced respiratory depression and collapsed. After medical personnel revived me, I experienced numbers, sorry, numbness, temporary amnesia and a dry mouth and a sore throat. We later found a needle mark on my arm, verified by a doctor. I did not black out, instead experiencing the whole thing as an abstract, as an abstract psychedelic horror trip. Absolutely horrifying, isn't it, that this is happening. Wow. Um, I was totally conscious that, but disconnected from my body and identity. Meanwhile, in reality, I was turning blue and convulsing on the floor. Once I became responsive, I was taken to the coat check area and told I had to leave. By the time I did not understand the language, could not walk and could barely see. I returned to reality with no idea what had happened or how it had happened. My trip had felt like an eternity and I couldn't recollect the events that preceded it. Apparently I kept saying sorry. The bouncers escorted me out to the club before the amnesia had worn off, enough for me to know where I was. A friend kept me company while I sat outside completely bewildered and without a way of accessing my own home. My keys were in a bag that someone else had the coat check token for, which I tried to explain to them, but I couldn't properly talk. All the while, believe me, I just, I must have done something terribly wrong. This fear and confusion had, sorry, this fear and conf confusion has contributed to a very strange kind of trauma that I'm still grappling with. I have been in touch with the club and they have assured me of this situation they are taking seriously and they have words and they will have words with bouncers about how they treat their situations in the future. I'm admittedly quite shaken, shocked that I was treated in the way that I was in a place I previously felt so safe, but far more shocked by the fact that this needle spiking incident is, is apparently all too real. I cannot fathom that would, um, what would lead someone to do something like this to another human being. It defies all reason. If you see someone in trouble at a club, check your body for needle marks. They all should, they should also go to hospital immediately for a drug test. Whatever substance this is, this is not a regular date rape drug. I had not been kicked out by my by bouncer so swiftly. I'd probably have gone to hospital myself, but I was so lost, confused and scared that I just went home in a daze. Luckily, a very good friend kept me company the whole time. Or I don't know what on earth I would have done. Look out for your friends and be extra safe out there. I should care for sorry out there. What an absolutely shocking and harrowing story. And something that I've heard myself through my kind of, you know, research online and whatnot. And definitely something I've heard has been happening on a grapevine. But something that hasn't really been addressed in any sort of public way by the club or by people that tend to go there. Now, probably the reason why people do that is because they're afraid of maybe upsetting people at the club. They don't want to seem to be a snitch or whatever it may be. That may be what part of the reason why people are kind of being a bit quiet about it. Because it feels like this is something that's kind of only been spoken about within that the local scene around Berlin or around Bergheim specifically. So maybe this is the reason why um but i have heard other accounts of this and not particularly the needle spiking but spiking in terms of drinks and people have been kind of you know being told to kind of look after the drinks and take care in that regard but it's really concerning because like i said previously i would imagine if you were a woman or if you were somebody from the lgbtq plus scene and you actually went to go to a club and you actually went to let your hair down have a good time that one of the main places you would go to was of course if you'd go to a club night that was more catered towards your interests your lifestyle whatever it may be but secondly going to a place like berlin and going to a club like berlin would be really up on your list high high up on your list because you know you know the whole premise behind that place is that they are you know a place where you can kind of go covered of iphone no cameras um you can kind of go there and really kind of be yourself and let your hair down and let loose but it seems like within that space people are also taking advantage of that kind of goodwill everyone has when they're going in there um how people kind of let their guard down for the most part and they're also kind of doing some really crazy stuff that you would you would associate with like commercial clubs you know what i mean this is the kind of stuff that happens you would imagine in like your really bait west end club or whatever it may be but you wouldn't be thinking it'd be happening in a place like Berghain. and just imagine how scary that must be to be on the dance floor somewhere like that having the time of your life and then suddenly be you know on the floor convulsing having an absolute shocker of a time and then being told you have to get out of the club that's the first thing they're kind of telling you to do they're not even trying to help you um kind of get better or kind of you know um 
give you some good aftercare it's all just kind of get you out because i guess i don't want to be liable in case something does happen to you kind of take you off premises i don't really know the whole thing about it but that's the only kind of disappointing thing but then the other side of it as well if it's just regular bouncers it's kind of hard to expect regular bouncers who are just doing their job bouncing to also be adept at knowing how to deal with people when they go through an episode in terms of drugs because number one they don't know you know unless it's somebody who's an absolute specialist it's hard for a bouncer to determine whether the person has got spiked whether they're just having a bad trip you know whether they took too much like it's really difficult i'd imagine to ascertain which probably is which probably might be the reason why they should be having more kind of um what they call them um they should be maybe having more medical personnel on a dance floor anyway just making sure everyone's okay for the most part the reason why they don't do that is because from what i've understood looking at it from the outside in um in comparison to like london clubs where like you have security guards and you know medical personnel walking through the nightclub with flashlights on right completely taking you out of your zone completely taking you out of the vibe of the place and really kind of cutting you off from kind of letting loose so they kind of try to not do that by having people in plain clothes walk around and just kind of mill around from time to time. But I guess obviously with that, people take advantage and they see there's not a lot of people or security or whatever looking at you on the dance floor so they can just do whatever and try and get away with it, which is absolutely crazy, crazy, crazy scary. Especially as a foreigner going to that place, right? Because most of the people that work, you know, around or in the Bergheim for the most part yes they can speak English but for the most part they're like you know born and bred Germans do you know what I mean so that language barrier when you're drunk when you're high it must be crazy to kind of get through to kind of figure out what's actually going on with you and um, that feeling of guilt too saying sorry all the time is crazy like oh yeah yeah the only time I can remember having a similar type experience was kind of was obviously something that I did myself it wasn't anything con concerning spiking but I think if I'm not mistaken I was there I was at Berghain just maybe a day after that I did the flipping Berlin half marathon or something it must have been around that kind of time so I was incredibly tired I think I'd fasted as well that day and I went straight in was drinking doing drugs and stuff on an empty stomach and I just ended up just like crashing and dying on one of the dark rooms I think it might have been a dark room next to the toilet on the main Berghain floor I was just in there just died right and I guess when I was in there dying I had my phone in my hand and it dropped on the floor and it smashed and someone picked it up and put it on my chest <laughs> and then I kind of was awoken by like a security guard and I think a kind of medical person I was checking if I was like oh, yeah I was perfectly fine and they're like are oh, you just tell you I just fell asleep I'm just tired and then I was like I also what the time was I think it was like Monday I don't know 2 a.m I was like okay I'm just gonna go home yeah don't worry then. maybe it's time you go home and they just kind of you know escorted me downstairs and that was it as I went home and it wasn't anything that bad I just fell asleep because I was legitimately tired knackered 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 which is kind of embarrassing to say that I fell asleep in a burger but it is it happens but I can only imagine how disorientating if we can feel to kind of get spiked in that regard right in that in that moment um but yeah hopefully this is a wake-up call for everybody involved especially people that work there um in terms of being able to look after and handle people when they go through such episodes hopefully it's also a wake-up call for people that go there and not to be so careless and just to again not to kind of um take their eye off the prize or eye off the ball um because they're in Berkeley and they think everything's going to be okay you have to have to keep your head on a swivel regardless of where you are you always have to do that I've learned that the hard way especially when you go to foreign countries and you forget your wallet on a flipping cafe table and come back and think you're going to find it nah 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 always keep your head on a swivel always kind of look after yourself in that regard um, it's unfortunate that this has to happen in that way and people have to change the way they kind of interact with these spaces because you would imagine part of the reason why these places exist is because you want to sort of create your own version of what a utopia is it's not obviously utopia there's always problems associated with it but you want to try to create something close to it so people feel comfortable so that they don't always have to be on edge when they're going out but unfortunately we live in sick time we live in a sick world um the people that are going there for the most part get it and the people that get it are still the ones who are trying to inflict damage and harm onto others in it so that's the saddest part about it but according to what i've seen online here an update courtesy of the lady herself it says wow a lot of a lot to process here a lot to say for now just two important pieces of info i have learned today firstly if you have been affected by the spiking or any kind you can get in touch with the berlin club commission directly to share your experience at dj at club .d. and secondly if this happens to you go straight to the hospital for a drug test and ask for hiv post exposure prolaxius jesus which is effective within 72 hours of exposure ask to be treated for ghb for 
fentanyl and scolopolaminic scolopolamine jesus christ how awful is that in it but yeah um hopefully she gets better soon especially just torn run stress coming from this and hopefully this piece of information will serve as a good reminder or heads up for people that are going there to make sure that they kind of keep their head in a swivel in it next on the list i have this article courtesy of deadline concerning the one and only no clock who basically has given a bit of an interview with um deadline i guess in an effort to rebuild his reputation and allow him to kind of come back into the cultural conversation to kind of regain his career start doing the thing that he knows how to do best in terms of directing acting or not but i think the way he's gone about it is pretty nuts and the headline reads as follows i've lost everything i lost everything sorry no clark likens council culture to modern day mccarthyism after uk police cease sexual harassment investigation so it says as follows British actor producer Noel Clark has spoken out for the first time since the Metropolitan Police announced that none of the allegations um, of being sexual predator but and bully made against the BAFTA award winner met the threshold for further police inquiry and they would be ceasing to investigate him. So it's very clear what they did, right? You know, I guess this is probably the reason why a lot of women don't come out and say anything in the first place because it's pretty difficult to prove, you know, or to kind of punish your perpetrator for for being handsy or to punish somebody for being a bully or whatever maybe or manipulating in the workplace it's pretty difficult to kind of charge against that so the british police probably have other things to do and they decided hey we're going to drop this and move on clark who has clark who saw a catalog of projects cancelled in the light of the allegations made against him and had the closure of his production company told the daily mail as follows there has been no arrest, no charges, no trial, no verdict, but I've been criminalized. This is a form of modern day McCarthyism. He said, if they don't need police and judges and juries anymore, if you only need social media and broadcasters, then what world do we live in? At what point did the broadcasters of this country become the judges, juries and executions of people? And at what point did BAFTA decide that they were no longer about films, but they were about judging people's lives? This is not about me, it's bigger. It's about due process. Yes, people have said things about me, but if I say you're a donkey, it doesn't make you a donkey, does it? <sighs> Look, I'm, I'm all for people... I think I've said it plenty of times on here. I'm all for people fighting against cancel culture. I think it's very important for the, for the, yeah, I think as important as cancel culture is, because there is no, cancel culture I feel like comes in when maybe there isn't any um, resolution to be made in the courts, when maybe it's, you know, it's, you know, too much time has gone past, maybe the person has died, whatever it may be, or passed away. Counter culture is one way where victims can kind of try to get some justice for any wrongdoing that they felt happened to them in a you know in a previous occupation in a previous one line of you know line of work whatever it may be but i also think on the same token if you've been accused of something you have the right to kind of fight against it and argue your case and whatever it may be the issue is for the most part no one's going to listen to you and usually the court of public opinion makes up their mind pretty quickly and usually always sides with the victim but it is pick possible for you to kind of fight your case with some sort of level of reason logic rational thinking and maybe sympathy and understanding that could get you to win people over it's not easy but it is possible i just think when you come out and you're so combative like this it doesn't make any sense especially when you think about the cases and about the accusations that were levied against um no clock if you remember there were like 20 plus women who alleged that he was too handsy who alleged that maybe he was a bit of a bully on the workplace and from what we saw from the accounts that were put out there they were pretty detailed and they sounded like something that he might have done now he could say is that punish is that should that be punishable with me having my career taken away from me now obviously for me i would say no because i i've always been under the liking or under the thinking that counterculture should only work if the audience and the fans say that they don't want you to do the thing anymore so if you get accused of something heinous but you don't get found guilty in a court of law but your fans decide not to back you anymore which then leads the broadcasters and the tv production companies not to you know back you and put money behind your project anymore because they're not going to make any money back then that's okay but what i don't like is the sort of broadcaster deciding hey you're not good for business we're going to get rid of you but this is also nothing new 
if you have a bad reputation, if you're not well liked in the public, um, if you're divisive in a really extreme way, most of the times production companies, broadcasters, uh, media conglomerates are going to stay the hell away from you because you're bad for business. Hollywood's a good example of it. The amount of money that it takes to make movies, they just can't afford to have somebody on there that's been charged or been accused of harassment or rape or whatever it may be because it's going to severely affect um, their ability to make money back on that movie and that's what they're trying to all do right they're trying to make a movie for you know as little as they can and obviously make as much as they can when they eventually put it out um you know in the in the cinemas that goes on dvd or whatever it may be or streaming platforms so this isn't nothing new so i think him saying oh um at what point did the broadcast in this country become judge jurors and executioners this has been happening from minute day dot and this whole adage that he's using here about being accused of being a donkey doesn't mean you're a donkey is incredible because so far we've not heard him try to defend himself in any kind of clear and rational way against the charges that were levied against him because they were very detailed. I remember one lady specifically, some actress who was like blonde, detailed a pretty detailed like list of things that happened. She was speaking about how he, her and No Clark were friends beforehand and he used to help her in her career, recommend things, text her stuff encouraging stuff and then suddenly out of nowhere he starts getting really handsy or whatever or proposition something i forgot what it may be and it sounded something legit because they had a prior relationship before why would she just suddenly make something up it doesn't make any sense and then of course off the back of it there were other people that were also saying things like um what they call them um, showrunners and even these type of people that are associated with TV production companies and stuff and movies and whatnot and it all sounded pretty legit so unless you come out and defend yourself against those allegations it's hard to then sit there and say oh because I've been called a donkey doesn't mean I am one it's like nah mate you still haven't really clarified what actually happened then have you um, which is I guess I think one of the reasons why this makes it a bit fishy and also one of the reasons why I kind of hate when people try to defend themselves against this because they they want to have they want to have everything they want to have the ability to, for, for, for them not to be cancelled when people accuse them of things but they also don't want to explain like their side of the story because they don't want more attention to be brought upon it so they just want people to just forget it and move on it's like no that's not how it works mate Anyway, it, happened, it continues. His comments come after the BAFTA suspended his membership and withdrew his award to him for outstanding achievement in the British film industry. Their complaints were made by more than 20 women and spanned over a 15-year period, with the claims including unwanted touching, groping, inappropriate behaviour and covert filming of naked audition. Oh, I forgot about that one. That was a hot one bloody hell clark has always denied allegations that made against him he is now suing bafta and the guardian for defamation wow he's also oh yeah because the guardian wrote an article about him right an op-ed kind of highlighting victims or whatnot he's also suing magazine publisher Condé Nast, which ran a piece about the controversy in his gq magazine he says 20 years of work was gone in 24 hours i lost everything the company i built from the ground up my tv shows my movies my book deals the initial respect i had in my heart and in my head it has changed me in a way I cannot articulate it's one if he's genuinely innocent then I guess I get the vim he's going against him because he's attacking everybody that came against him I'm surprised he hasn't he's not going after Instagram blogs and stuff but yeah if he generally thinks he didn't do anything wrong then fair enough but I just think it's difficult to live in a world where you really believe that there could be 20 different women who probably don't have that much connection to each other apart from they worked with no clock before suddenly decided to wake up and just make up statements about you it doesn't seem like it makes sense does it they just all woke up one day and decided you know what well, one after the other we're gonna make up these very detailed allegations against this person we worked with and even though we know he's a very powerful and he's got these connections and if this doesn't go right this could hurt our career we're gonna do it anyway it doesn't really make any sense but you know what, what can you do Looking ahead, he says he wants the film and TV industry to create a framework where women and vulnerable people are protected, but which also protects people who may have thrown under the bus unjustly. Differ differentiate between an evil guy and somebody who might have made a misstep. That's a very telling thing he says there. So what's he trying to say? Is he trying to say all those 20 occasions that he was accused of were missteps? 20 missteps is a lot of missteps. Do you know what I mean? That's the issue. It's a lot of misstepping. Um, usually for most guys... You, you you know you might become handsy with one person because you read the signals wrong and then you get slapped on the face or you get slapped in the hand and usually it never happens again because it's very embarrassing um 
um, it kind of rids you of any sort of sense of dignity, whatever it may be, even though you try to rid that person's dignity. But you know what I mean, right? It's incredibly, incredibly embarrassing and cringe that you're forced to make a change, especially if you're a decent person. You're like, oh, I don't want to feel like that again. I don't want a girl to ever look at me like that and feel afraid. You know, all those kind of things kind of come into you for the most part. And, and, and usually if you're a decent person, you'll change. It's like making a move on a girl first time and, you know, especially a kiss or something like that, which is even worse in terms of the embarrassment. And then they pull back and recoil, make this really weird scrunch up face. You don't want it to ever happen again. So you, you, you decide to go back to the drawing board. And you're like, okay, cool. Next time I'm going to make sure I ask permission. Next time I'm going to make sure I read the signs properly. Next, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. But to say you did missteps is just a weird phrase to use when people are not accusing you of like, making a bad decision in a marketing flipping campaign they're accusing you of you know recording them naked when they're on audition they're accusing you of like groping them inappropriately on a film set or something or you know saying stuff to them that you probably shouldn't say in a green room whatever it may be that's what they're accusing you of it's a very detailed and precise and very specific things that they kind of levied against you they're not missteps in terms of you know you should have maybe pitched channel four instead of pitching channel five um, but anyway, Clark adds that he can't see any easy way back to his career after being cancelled. None of them wants me to be wrong. None of them wants to be wrong. They made such a big, bold statements that they and then there's the current climate. The moment anyone speaks out, even says, hold on a second, what's the context? Society turns on them too. Funny enough, he's not going after the ladies who did accuse him what they accused him of. He's going after the, the, the platforms who basically um gave these people a space to speak or maybe reported on the you know on what he's been alleged of he's not actually going after the victim that's interesting because you can sue for defamation in the uk but he's not that's a bit of a telltale but again let's see how this plays out i think the way he's going about it is a little bit too um what i say he's a little bit too heavy-handed in his approach but if he generally thinks that he didn't do anything wrong and his livelihood's been taken away from him he's ability to feed his family his ability to you know express stuff creatively he said he said 20 years of work completely gone down the drain then maybe this is what you should be doing if you legitimately think you're innocent but i just think 20 plus you know people coming up after you it just doesn't make any sense why they'd all lie together and if they did lie why don't you go sue every single one of them instead of suing the the guardian and gq and condé nas and shit and i mean go after those people but who knows maybe he feels like if he's able to you know get the better of these publishers and these platforms and stuff that maybe that might be a better way to kind of repair his public re reputation but you know unfortunately especially because it's the uk too i've noticed it feels like the uk we don't really have a lot of time for people who do anything that concerns with you know um sexual harassment touching up kids and stuff if you get accused of something like that it's very difficult to kind of get that stain off of you in the uk or to kind of get back to your normal career unless you're like a Tory or something I mean you can get away with anything but for the most part if you're a regular civilian it's very difficult to be accused of what he's been accused of and then try to um you know uh recover your career it's nearly impossible for the most part so let's see what happens let's see how that plot one plays out next on the list here we have what do you want to talk about here? Oh, it's me about this one. Yes, this is one. Yeah, it's about this quickly. So this is courtesy of Twitter. And this is courtesy, of course, from the reps sneakers subreddit also. This is a minor thing that happened in my little sphere of interest. But essentially on Twitter, for the most part, um, or on sneaker Twitter, you would say, a bit of uproar was caused when one of these guys called a sneaker fetish, fetish spelt with a P, um, decided to get on Twitter and kind of cause a bit of disturbance by saying the following. I'll say it again, if you buy fake sneakers with real money, you lost, which caused, you know, the whole entire sneaker subreddit, rep sneaker subreddit to basically implode, which then led to a Twitter spaces where this YouTube guy, aka sneaker fetish, decided to start a space talking about the harm that sneakers, that resellers have done to the industry, why people buy fakes in the first place. Is it something to do with the store? Is it something to do with the brands, um, the, you know, the customers, bots, all this sort of stuff that came out of it. And my opinion in general, why I think replica sneakers, unauthorized sneakers, whatever they may be, have become such um, popular commodities nowadays. I think it's for the it's for it's for the most part to do with this. 
I worked for a very, or I used to work in a very, very, very popular Nike store, right? One of the most popular Nike stores ever when it launched at the time, especially in the country. And we used to get loads of the most, you know, we used to get a lot of limited edition shoes. But I also spent many years prior to that queuing outside of stores, queuing overnight, queuing all day, you know, going through McDonald's runs, sometimes queuing for 17 hours and not getting anything, like crazy amount of dumb stuff I did just so I could get sneakers for myself for the most part. There were some occasions here and there that I might have resold stuff just to kind of, you know, get your thing for free. You'd buy two and then basically the one that you keep ends up being for free because you end up selling the one that you sold for double the value. But for the most part, it was always about just trying to get a hold of these limited edition shoes that you couldn't get anywhere else because you loved sneakers that much. But I can tell you this categorically, having worked in one of the most popular Nike stores in the world, that for the most part, the sneaker industry or market is completely broken because before the shoes even get to regular stores, again, I work for a Nike store. So again, all the stuff directly from Nike, they were already being backdoored in their own way through people from head office who were getting pairs and siphoning them off. People that were buying the shoes into the country already taking stuff off our allocations. So by the time the shoes came to the actual store, whatever was available was very a, a very small amount um, vis-a-vis what actually hit the shores. By the time those things hit the shores, it kind of got broken up and sent to different people, and you know you couldn't even figure out who got the who got the pairs, who didn't get the pairs. And I always used to think back then how unfair it was that regular folks couldn't get a hold of sneakers. This is when I was in a very privileged position. And I used to think it was so unfair that no regular people could get a pair because by the time the shoe came to our store, we'd only have like 10 pairs left. And then there's like five of us working in the store. All of us are sneakerheads. Those five are already going. By the time those five are already on, on, the, on the shop floor, they've already gone before, you know, before we're already one hour open, which is incredibly, incredibly unfair. And I think even worse now because the sneaker industry, the, you know, in general, is a multi-billion dollar industry. Everybody and their mum is a sneakerhead. Everybody knows what a Yeezy is. Everyone knows what reselling is. Everyone knows what StockX is. Everyone knows what how to sell sneakers on eBay, sell them on Instagram, sell them on Facebook groups, on Discords. Everybody knows about the entire industry of sneakers. It's not some secret thing anymore. It's not some niche subculture with only like a hundred thousand. Because I think even back then when I was buying sneakers, there might be only like a hundred thousand of us around the world who are really heavy in terms of buying those shoes. Um, resellers are popping up every single couple of minutes here and there and i think now things have gotten so worse now that people in major you know in the big nike office in oregon are being outed for basically using their company car to buy sneakers and to get stuff backdoored and stuff we hear in this report allegedly of marcus jordan the son of you know michael jordan essentially selling shoes out of boxes in a hotel room to resellers and then go and sell them again all allegedly but the game is so rigged and broken now that it is near on impossible for regular consumers to guarantee themselves to get a pair of shoes that they want limited edition ones through the regular system of raffles and stuff it doesn't happen most stores now don't let you queue outside of the stores due to local you know local restrictions due to the store maybe not wanting that kind of attention at their store whatever it may be or the brand deciding they don't want that kind of press whatever so the idea that you could go and just wake up early to get the shoes that's gone out of the window you have to get all it done via the raffles the raffle system is completely rigged no one knows how it works no one knows if it does work properly sometimes you get lucky sometimes you don't get lucky like i said i was fortunate you know i didn't get anything for a couple of years on that on the sneakers app then one time i ended up getting like four pairs of flipping off-white jordans via the sneakers app which is absolutely incredible but for the most part it's all a sham right it's all a sham so the brands for the most part create artificial scarcity then the brands themselves also don't necessarily have any care in the world for how their sneakers are allocated the numbers um they don't necessarily have any checks and balances to make sure shoes are going out to the right places to make sure the shoes you know the right route the might the right amount sorry of shoes are going to the right places they also don't make sure that people aren't backdooring stuff they're not making sure that people in the main offices aren't kind of siphoning things off before they've even hit the shop floor all these things aren't happening so naturally if that's the case then kids or people in general who want these shoes and don't want to go through all that madness will gonna are easily going to go to the rep side of things because the system is broken. And the only way to fix the system is to get the brand to make more. But for whatever reason, 
sneakerheads like this guy and other sneakers in general it's really interesting that sneakers themselves are policing people they're telling people hey you shouldn't wear fakes they're also telling people that you know the brands are never going to make any more so they kind of they kind of enjoy this weird kind of relationship they have with a brand where they kind of get shown things that they that that they that they think they can buy they can't buy them then they have to be subjected to months or weeks of influences all over the world wearing them and making them look absolutely terrible and then when the shoes eventually drop they don't get they don't get a pair but at least they have the ability to show a screenshot of them saying, you know, from Nike sneakers app, oh, you do, your name wasn't drawn yet or an, an email from Dover Street or an email from End. And it's a very interesting space. Very, very interesting to see that. Um, on one side, again, like I said, you've got replica sneaker buyers who are somehow very sensitive to and don't necessarily like it when people take the mickey out of them or take the piss out of them for buying fake shoes, which is always going to happen. It doesn't matter how good they look. If you're buying shoes that are not, bought from the legitimate retailers you're always going to get taken a piss out of so just grow up and kind of you know suck it up then on the other side you've got people who buy legitimate shoes who are policing people who buy fake shoes and telling them not to buy it when they know full well the only reason why those kids are buying those shoes at that time is because they can't buy the shoes normally in a kind of reasonable way it doesn't exist what now you're going to expect kids to go buy bots to buy them you're going to do you know what I mean like or regular people to buy bots in order to secure a pair it doesn't make any sense and then resellers are also not seeing their um place in the industry and how they're affecting things because they basically add to the scarcity of products available because they obviously clearly want to make money and they end up buying up pairs even though they don't want to wear them so just to resell them to other people who can afford them which effectively takes them out of the hands of the majority of people who don't have the money to pay resale prices so it's an absolutely fucked mark fucked industry but i think ultimately unless the brands themselves take any responsibility and actually start to make more or start to actually punish people when they do start backdooring stuff or you know reprimand people like still now after the reports came out about marcus jordan have we heard anything concerning his accounts being taken away from him have we heard anything about nike parting ways of him zero 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 and i think basically because that happens allegedly i think on a mass scale across the entire company it's crossing loads of different sports brands not just nike adidas reebok you know feeler whatever mizuno as asics they all have their version of the same person who does the same thing who takes stuff off the flipping list before it covers the shop floor and then ends up affecting sneakerheads the world over and i think that's a really disappointing part about the entire thing um but it's just funny as well just to see sneakerheads kind of policing each other and telling each other hey you shouldn't be buying this you should be buying that it's like come on man come on these brands have brainwashed us so much that we're basically telling each other what to do and how to spend our money when in reality we should be putting it on these brands and telling them hey make more or basically give us more options to go and buy these things or maybe try to double check the numbers and make sure the stores the shoes that are meant you know the, the, the shoes are meant to be arriving at certain stores actually arrive in the first place and they don't get siphoned off at the flipping border do all that first and then then we can start talking about the flipping um the morality of wearing or buying sneaks or whatever maybe or buying so sneaks buying fakes or whatnot but it's a really pl weird place to be in but yeah that is what i need to talk about on that one <clears throat> some water here that's nice the next on list here we've got this news courtesy of over under regarding 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 one of the most interesting pairs of shoes i've seen in a long time this is courtesy of Ami Leondor, of course, who else could it be regarding their Made in the UK 991s, which are due to come out very, very, very soon. And they look so bloody hard, it's not even funny. The only thing I don't like is this little promo video they put together. I'm going to play a video of the sound, obviously, because it's going to um, copyright strike me. But I don't like the video. Um, I've never really been into this kind of um, imagine the soldier thing. I don't like the whole pretending to be chav thing. I think it's annoying. I think it's pandering. I think it's. Um, I think it's just it's just cringe, really, for the most part, right? Getting people to dress up like you know from an era that they've never lived in, which just doesn't make any sense to me. But again, Ami Leon knows how to do this better than anyone um, when it comes to kind of nailing this 
late what would you call it late 80s early 90s aesthetic they kind of do it really really bloody well and in general the product itself speaks for itself doesn't it the shoes are absolutely incredible i think i spoke about it previously maybe online what i mentioned the brown pair reminds me kind of of a weird curry dunk um in terms of the color remember those curry dunks that came out all ages ago they had a really nice leather that kind of wore in amazingly over time so they remind me a little bit of that but they got these little amazing green hits all over the place and another kind of thing that i thought was really cool was that i've always believed in general that 991s or new balances you know 990s and 991s for the most part work the best when they have an off-white or some sort of white midsole i'm not really the biggest fan of the black midsole even though john will be doing a great job in terms of um bringing that design language to the forefront i think for the most part um classic new balances tend to work the best especially this sort of like techie kind of upper looking type of stuff tends to look really better when you kind of break up the colors of the midsole so either by having them completely off-white or having them like they've done here with this brown pair we've got this kind of off white tea sort of white colorway here and then you've got the kind of gray on the forefoot there of course with the separation of the heel canter doing a little bit of damage there too but overall as an overall colorway this brown colorway is absolutely banging that looks really bloody good and of course there's some clothing included in it too a capsule collection with some clothing too there saying aod <clears throat> i'm assuming anyway that's probably the case and then in the background you've got this colorway which kind of reminds me again of maybe of an air trainer one kind of vibe but i do like the fact that they've got these um little um hints that are running through both pairs you've got this kind of pine olive green hits happening on both pairs just not on the tongue on the gray they've got it on the tongue they've got on the toe but skirt towards the heel um and then they've got i don't know if the heel canter is a similar color too and then they've got the same thing on the browns and it's just really classically and easily and qualitatively done now maybe this is a standard colorway that they've kind of pulled out from the archives and ALD has basically applied it on their own new balance but it's interesting that such a simple colorway that I think is again something that new balance should be making year in year out or maybe every other year um in line is something that a brand has to come and do and kind of you know introduce onto the market which is funny isn't it you'd imagine you'd think that they have all these kind of things to hand but who knows maybe this is completely something they created from scratch or they're taking inspiration from classic colorways and basically just kind of added some hits here and there in because this kind of reminds me a little bit of a crooked tongues new balance that came out too that was a similar sort of colorway but this does harken back to that sort of era of crooked tongues new balance collaborations with made in england new balances where they were made really tastefully even the stuff that like um hikmet from soulbox did back in the day with new balance they were always done with minimal crazy color combinations always maybe a base of maybe let's say maximum five colors but you know maybe three of them are the same are the same color but different tones or different shades instead of just going for the crazy sort of like nike id every panel is a different color thing i like that they've kind of done in a really tasteful way and um yeah overall they just look absolutely banging and again the lacing is done well at least they've attempted to do the lacing you know making them look like they haven't just come out from the box and just left them as it is that's always something that always kind of gets my grind or grinds my gears gets my grind grinds my gears but overall i think they've done really really well in how they put them together and judging by the reception online as you can see from the comments here people are going absolutely crazy for them so these are going to be great heavy bloke core which i don't like that whole thing bloke core which is kids basically dressing up like hooligans or like people that like to watch football but they don't watch football which is a really bizarre thing but i guess that's the world we live in and here's some extra pictures again courtesy of over under saying teddy sanders founder uh of ami leondor newly appointed creator of new balance uh, made in usa previews a new emily and door new balance 991 and 550 interesting that he's the creative director of made in usa new balances but he's also collaborating on these and they're made in the uk but i guess because if i'm not mistaken the the, the craftsmanship that goes into this is crazy because they're essentially all made by hand and the silhouette like the flatness of that toe box like which is something i always talk about because nike don't do this at all with their retros they completely fucked the flipping air max light which is one of my great one one of my favorite air maxes of all time even the air structure to some extent got fucked up in that regard no the air stab sorry got fucked up in that regards they really mess up their retro but for some reason new balance are able to make 
their new balances made in England basically to spec in terms of vintage or old school pairs. They look crazy um, good in terms of the quality, in terms of the silhouette, in terms of the shape. You've got this really flat sort of toe box thing happening, which I kind of hearken to like a triangle, right? Um, or like to a half triangle on the side. And it's kind of got this really peaky flat sole in the front here. Whereas Nike ones usually have a weird banana thing kind of spooning up here towards the front. But they look really cool in a brown. Um, if I was going to go for a pair, I'd probably go for the white and greys, maybe. Like, look how good these look with the jeans rolled up like that. Like, oh, stonewashed denim, a pair of these. Obviously not with the ankle socks. That's G-A-Y. But overall, these look really, really great. Like, so, so good. You can't go wrong with a pair of these, in it? And I actually love how they how that kind of the grey flows in towards the front of the toe box here with this little um, front forefoot thing going on here at the front. And look at how they look from the top with the green hits here. Oh, yeah, yeah. They look so good, man. So bloody good. Um, continue to scroll down here. You've got other pictures, I guess, of maybe some up and coming stuff happening with ALD um, or Teddy working there. New Balance. This is obviously a pair that they've plucked out from the archives. Um, and again, this is something Nike should be doing. They should easily be able to retro, you know, old flipping. A, a ACG stuff, Air Max stuff, Air Trainer stuff, and make them to spec. It shouldn't be difficult to do, but they keep giving us excuses. They keep retroing Jordans and Dunks and Air Force Ones, and just kind of making boring, boring thing after boring thing, and we keep hoovering it up because we don't know any better. But yeah, even these off-white looking New Balance nine nine zeros are absolutely stupendous looking in it. The colors as well, so well, so well done with the white with this off-white colors here this kind of cream off-white thing going on the mesh the gray oh, come on man so well done but yeah these are happening or these are releasing hopefully very soon um no release date yet in terms of when exactly they do drop but i guess you have to sign up to the mailing list and the other thing too that everyone needs to kind of wake up about is that allegedly these, these are meant to be like what 275 pounds or something so you're going to have to have some deep pockets to be able to spend on the pair of these or maybe you're going to have to retrain your mind to be okay to sp with spending 275 pound a pair of new balances which is not too far from spending you know a couple of hundred pound more on some designer sneakers but this is the way these things are and these things are really going to be really well made so don't sleep on them if you do get a chance to buy them do not sleep on them because these are hardcore man god damn these look good these look so so good can't wait to get a pair honestly cannot wait to get a pair moving on we've got this courtesy of over under again regarding a neck face nike dunk sb low releasing in october 2022 now i'm surprised neck face hasn't done more collaborations with nike if i'm not mistaken he did a dunk high a blazer that was nice that can came in like yellow um but overall we haven't seen nothing too nutty from him I don't know why I, I expect him to do something more like um, more Jeremy Scottish, what he did with Adidas in terms of Neckface's art and some of the stuff that he does in terms of his installations or exhibitions. I just would have, or even some of his sculptures, I would have assumed his shoes would just be a bit more far out looking wise. But for the most part, his previous collaborations with Nike have been kind of run of the mill. Just him kind of changing some panels on a dunk or the uppers on a, on a blazer or something, but nothing really that kind of changes the overall form factor or the shape um, or the textures, or whatever it may be, or the paneling of a shoe. And this is the first time he's obviously done it with a pair of dunks. And I think this is maybe one of the best I've seen in a while because they just look nuts. So, Kirsty, if, you, if you're if you not seeing the picture on the screen, it's essentially an all black dunk um, with a white midsole and black outsole. It looks like it's designed all in mesh and it's completely covered in badges. Um, or patches, sorry, um, that of Neckface's illustrations covering all over the entirety of the shoe. And the only swoosh motif that you see is on the toe box, similar to like an Air Max, and again towards the upper collar. But for the most part, it's completely, completely covered in all these badges, which I kind of like because it reminds me of a lot of the guys who you, I used to see at the other buy and stuff who maybe were fans of Neckface and whatnot, who'd wear their denim jackets covered in badges from bands and stuff they were into, or just random badges that they picked up 
stuff from Brian or something. Do you know what I mean? And I loved all that stuff. I really, really loved all that stuff. And I think this looks really, really great. This is something that's more in line with the Netflix that I know as an artist. Um, but maybe he's purposely not done this because he just doesn't want to do a lot of co commercial collaborations. He doesn't want to maybe, you know, water down his um, art that he actually takes seriously or some of the graffiti stuff that he does not really sure. But I'm surprised he hasn't done more. Or I'm actually surprised he hasn't done more with, you know, um, high-end designers like a Matthew Williams or even a Heron Preston. Those are those kind of guys who are like, who come from the streetwear world who would know who Neckface was, who'd know he's kind of... Um, his abilities and know his appeal and whatnot. I'm surprised this hasn't been something they've done more often, but maybe, you know, maybe maybe something they're thinking about. But I like them. I think they look really cool. Um, more pictures here of the instep um, with different badges on them. I wonder if the badges are going to be randomly applied or if it's going to be the same. I'd imagine it'd be the same throughout, but I really like what they look like. Um, essentially, it's just an all black suede dunk with patches all over them, but I really like the look of them, not going to lie. And I guess if you want to, you could always remove some patches if you didn't like how they were placed. But I like the entirety of it. It's got a custom insole there with some neck face um, illustrations on there. Again, the heel canter looks really cool. The heel tab, sorry, looks really amazing. All covered up as well. I love everything about it. I'm not going to lie. This was an upgrade. Loads of cool little pieces and bits on it. And some couple more pictures here too, detailing the entire thing. But I like it, man. Definitely shoes to get fucked up in. Definitely shoes to check out a band in. Shoes to take you take out on a night out if you're going to like a dive bar, hanging out with friends, but you still want to have a bit of pop on your feet. These are definitely the way to go, man. I like them. I think they look really cool. So October 2022, if you're interested in those bad boys. And again, there's a video here also showing you what they look like in hand. Not mad at these again. Dunks I'm a bit bored with. <clears throat> I can't wait for the dunk hype to be over or the dunk resurgence from Nike. But again, but being an OG streetwear head and obviously somebody that has met Neckface a couple of times here and there, scene wise, and has been a fan of his art for a long time, it's cool to see him kind of getting a bit of shine and be able to do some work on a dunk and be introduced to maybe a new clientele in terms of the kids coming up nowadays. But I am a bit bored of it. I'm not going to lie. Oh, I like the neck thing on the on the on the tab. That looks pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, that looks really cool. I like that. That little hit there looks nice. That's cool that they allowed him to do this. And this is cool that this is happening more often. Before this was a big deal when you'd be able to actually change the label on your collaboration. Usually it's just like a colorway change. But then they actually let people to go and actually be a bit crazy, be a bit creative and make some one off things that would actually be um, more special and might actually attract a wider audience of people or just people in general. Because, you know, it's not like the normal thing that you see out there. But yeah, those are really cool. I like them. I'm not going to lie. I like them. Then, of course, the big news of the day is courtesy of Nike regarding the Tom Sachs Nike Craft um, general purpose shoe that I've been eyeing up for a long time. I think I was one of the first people, I'm going to say, on the social media, on the internet or YouTube, who was very bullish and very kind of keen on these shoes. And I think I spoke about them being a really great kind of everyday wear a shoe that you could incorporate with different outfits, a shoe that was made for walking, a shoe that was made for working, a shoe that was made for just, you know, being a human being and, you know, kind of parading around the streets again in this post-pandemic world. But the only thing I'm a little bit disappointed in is that we still haven't got any information as to when, if ever, the rubberized toe Mars Yards that were basically being debuted and wear tested for a while with the kind of reinforced toe and the um, metal eyelets and maybe the reinforced upper when they're ever going to come out. We have no idea if they're going to come out. But regardless, Nike have updated us on one Nike Craft Tom Sachs shoe, which I'm really, really excited about. So it says as follows, this is Nike Craft announces an extraordinary shoe for extraordinary people. It says as follows, if the Mars Yard and Nike Tom Sachs introduction to the Nike Craft concept was designed for space going scientists, it's kin, the Nike Craft general purpose shoe GPS finds its footing in the everyday. Both, of course, build on the base idea, the sneakers, a daily tool, and has created with the same unwavering attention to detail. I like that it's called general purpose shoe, aka GPS meaning that it, actually, it is actually meant for walking, getting around your city, 
and actually being a human form of GPS. So that's pretty cool. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. The quote is as follows. I got involved with Nike in the beginning because we wanted to make a sculpture that everyone could wear. It's a tool for everyday life. It's democratic. I like the idea behind that. The GPS shape is distinct. Thanks to a slightly perky um, upturned toe, uh, but not too distinct. It's built with a three piece molded cup sole, signature donning straps and microfiber collar and ultra breathable knit packs a value punch. It took a decade to make a shoe this simple as simple as can be no simpler nike craft shuns innovation for its own sake but embraces it as a necess as a, as embraces it as a necessity can you imagine the amount of back and forth they must have had with tom in terms of just not just regurgitating the same shoe again in terms of that rubberized one that i want or in terms of just maybe getting loud and designing something crazy the fact that he'd go and want to design something that's basically for the most part, you know, cream and, you know, white looking with some white blue bits and hits and whatnot concerning what's out there in the market. This must have been something that he had to fight for major, I'd imagine, or maybe not, who knows. Um, the GPS engineering and materials are also chosen to provide comfort support and high degree of tactile sensation in a well-placed product. Consideration for the durability in or utility and style is shown in the upper material, open enough to be breathable, tight enough to ward off any few raindrops the quality of the donning straps and again of the three piece molded cup sole it says it took me years to best advantage the superpowers of scale and deliver value while still reflecting on the standards of the studio a great collaboration great collaboration sorry is something that no partner could do without the other the nike craft has always been a 50 50 collaboration says tom Sachs. the gps reminds us of the beauty of comes and creating connection with the things one wants staining it, tear it and repair it the gps is a tool to be best is the, to be the best you um they have an understanding understated sorry quality they're meant to do all things that you tell them to do and tell your story like the other great perennials of the sneaker world the nike craft gps will render the multiple color schemes the launch version the studio feature okay so is it? there's gonna be different colorways okay so let's read that again like the other great perennials of the sneaker world, the Nike Car GPS will render in multiple color schemes. The launch version, the studio, features a gum rubberized midsole, muted with white upper and a blue donning stripe. It's the new uniform colorway of the Tom Sachs studio team, and it could be your uniform too. It comes in women's sizes, 5 to 4 and 14 and a half, and men's sizes, 3 and a half to 14. Um, and 14 15 where uh, gps will be available on june 10th and it retails for 110 dollars which is pretty sick for a limited edition shoe to retail for retail for that much money is really good um it's pretty cheap concern considering how other expensive other limited edition shoes go for but that most of my explain because of the materials they've been using and how kind of you know conscious they are making it look a certain way why can't i see the pictures i don't know it's being dumb Let's scroll down oh. Is it, is it freeze now is it freeze have you freezed i guess it's freeze now but yeah overall i'm really happy to see them i can't wait to get a pair myself um this is something that i've been looking forward to checking out and wearing for a very 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 long time um it's good to finally have the date there set in terms of when we're going to be able to actually wear them and actually get them in hand ourselves so that's really cool to see i'm not going to lie um Oh, can we just not see? Oh, I have to download the images. Okay, I don't want to download the images, but let's just scan them. Let's see if we can just scan through these ones here down below. Yeah, these look these look bloody cool, and oh no, let's go back here again. Um, as you can see clearly, the ones that the ones that are worn look far better than the ones that are brand new, in my opinion. Anyway, they look far better. What do you think? I think definitely the worn one looks far better. Um, so I can't wait to get them worn and actually get some life into them and actually get stomping around the streets in them. Um, what do I think about the outside? The redesigned durable uh, waffle outside is decorated with an embossed Nike Craft logo in a US pattern. Um, the shoe is lightning hold foam tongue package with a high sealed edge. This finish with a Nike Craft of a label it's a language not so Nike craft support of all the activities and the value of allowing your wear to tell their own story and of course the box as well with the shoe itself on there it looks pretty hard I'm not going to lie I'm not going to lie 
um, and I can't wait for them to drop actually one of the shoes that I've been waiting to kind of pick up for a while so hopefully June 10th comes around and I get lucky on a sneakers app and I'm able to cop them but I should be okay to cop because I do remember when I said what I said about the shoe the general consensus online um, was that people didn't like them they hated them oh it's not great it's not the Mars Yard 2 which is obviously a classic and that's reselling for flipping five thousand dollars until this day even though I wear mine to the gym hilarious but still I was a big fan of the shoe from the day it dropped um, and no one else was so you would assume that now that it's got a release date that it should be okay for people to cop right I don't think so I think more likely than not because of all these pictures that we've seen of them there's that viral clip going around of Tom Sachs walking down the street really weird um, <laughs> he's kind of stomping you know what I mean really aggressively um, walking wherever he's going and someone recorded him wearing a pair so clearly um, the hype is brewing with these um, and I think over time people are going to like them more especially once people start changing their laces and you know doing all that stuff that people like to do in terms of making them look their own and there's some more pictures here courtesy of over under um, a guy called Verdi got his pair early and what we can see here looking at the top down of the shoe is that for the most part it's pretty thin in terms of padding on the inside they've got some um, you know padding here towards the heel um, there's obviously the straps here on the heel and the toes one well, or to kind of get the shoe in and then we've also got this funny shape thing here on the front of the on the toe box which looks pretty cool you don't necessarily see it from the side profile but it's very very cool i think that was all that what was that that rip stop sort of material thing they kept mentioning in the article right what was it um i think that might be what they're talking about here blah, 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 building the base sneaker daily um with the three piece cup midsole cup uh signature donning straps and microfiber collar and ultra breathable knit um yeah so that might be it I'm not too sure but some material that they were talking about I think that might be what is featured here at the top of it but I do like that different shape it's sort of like a what do you call it like a P design shape towards the front of the toe box which kind of allows your front toe to kind of be uh, free here I wonder if this is an ergonomic thing because it kind of is you know that that extra bit kind of goes over your little toes and then here your kind of big toes kind of left to kind of dangle out there in the front or maybe it's just a design language thing I'm not really too sure um, and then there's another one, another, and then, oh, but the concerning piece is this courtesy of an Instagram user called Papa Smurf 34, who got a pair early, it looks like, of the uh, general purpose shoe, right? As you can see, them fairly brand new and they look pretty decent in hand, not going to lie. But then after a few wears, they've already got a split on the side of the shoe. Now, is this because this person has tied them really tightly? Or because they didn't relace them or is it because this person who clearly you know might be on the bigger side if you look at their hand and whatnot and the fact that their their wrist is exploding out of their flipping um or the rolex is making their wrist explode maybe it's because of the weight thing or maybe it's because of the big foot big fat foot thing which i have i have a really wide foot um some will say fat but i'll say wide it's not fat it's definitely wide right and my main issue is that usually when it comes to narrow shoes i can't wear a lot of narrow shoes because the length usually fits but then sometimes the width isn't great but then if i size up in terms of length it then doesn't fit in terms of length and then it doesn't fit also to the width because it's just too big so it kind of hampers me in terms of wearing some slimmer design shoes like you know cool astro turfs that you know a jason deal would like or whatever it may be but this is very concerning that you know the people that have got their early um their early seeded pairs are already having issues with the splits here on the side um this is not something obviously you want to see going on but maybe this is might be just one of the early samples that might have an issue of them going forward but i do like the fact that they already look marked up maybe he hasn't worn them that often already but they do kind of crease up and mark up very easily so there isn't similar to the mars yards that basically were attracting dirt on the midsole and didn't really give you a chance to wear them brand new and have them dead stock i like that these have the similar sort of effect but if this is happening only after a couple of wears this is very very concerning already for people that have a pair very very concerning i would say but you know maybe this is just a a little minor bump in the road going forward but yeah i'm really eager to drop to have them in hand when they do drop again you know whether or not i'll be successful in terms of getting a pair for myself it remains to be seen but you know there might be a possibility that i might end up looking like the great man himself here oh I to, okay can't you just like view the picture in terms of having to do that 
Okay, you have to really, Okay, but anyway, this Tom Sachs obviously wearing a pair there in his signature outfit. And then you got this great advertising as well that they've featured as well that I thought was really well really, really well done. Um it says here uh boring. And I think they said the inspiration came from an old VW um uh advert for the Beetle back in the day. I'm pretty sure is it a beat or something else? And I think they labelled it a lemon and then kind of you know spoke about it in the same way. But this is for the general purpose shoe. It says as follows: uh, boring. Um, your sneakers shouldn't be the most exciting thing about you. I definitely agree about that. Or you shouldn't have your personality completely moulded around the sneakers you wear. Sorry, they're tools, and what matters about you about your tours is that they work that they do their job so that you can do yours you put them on forget about them you focus on getting a little bit faster get a little bit sharper and find the signal in the noise it took us 10 years to make a sneaker this simple as simple as that can be and no simpler do more sneaker and own less sneaker and show up and prove it and whole life be you sneaker it's not what you do it's how you do it the nike craft general purpose 109 available 10th of uh, February sorry 10th of June nikecraft.com so hopefully they have some really cool activations around it too that was one of the rings that was really sick about the Mars Yard activation that is amazing um, things concerning working now and designing and waking up and walking around and all this sort of activity based stuff that was really cool hopefully they have something similar regarding this general purpose shoe maybe something more tied into the actual motive around the shoe maybe something to do with you know walking a certain amount of steps every day or whatever it may be i think that's going to be really cool going forward so yeah i can't wait for these to drop i'm really excited for them to drop when they eventually do really really am excited so that was the excellent thing show episode number 381 thanks oh it's 381 581 thanks again for tuning in if it's your first time and you like what you hear you know what to do smash the like hit subscribe leave a comment down below if you're listening via um you know the audio app you're obviously going to hear a song at the end of this if you're watching via youtube it's just going to end and go completely black but again thank you for checking me out thank you for listening to the podcast and i'll check you guys out very very soon take care be safe peace